Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Tim, uh, the Clay. And uh, I wanted to make a video in response to Crazy Pills, uh, a.k.a. Steve. Uh, Steve, you've been uh, making videos for quite some time. You and I have bannered a little back and forth on a blog, and you've been uh, talking with my wife, Calvinist Girl. And uh, I wanted to make some observations uh, about your philosophy and the uh, worldview that you have and the view that you have of Calvinism. Uh, some other people have said it as well, and, 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 and I thought of this before I read other people sharing the opinion, is that uh, my opinion is that you just don't like God. And uh, I take that a little bit of a step further. I believe that the root issue is that you want to be God. And this is not a unique position. This is not something that uh, is not... Uh, common to every single unregenerate person on the face of the planet and it all started with Eve when the pride of life caused her to believe the lie from Satan that if you eat this fruit you will be like God and that is what she desired in her heart and that's what all man desires to be is to be God uh, nobody wants to submit to a God and so that's really what I think it is I don't think it's Calvinism per se that you have a problem with but I think it's the God of the Bible that you have a problem with. Um, Proverbs 16, 18 said, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. James 4, 5 through 7 says, But he gives a greater grace, therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And Matthew 23, 12 says, Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. I pray that the word of God penetrates your heart uh, and changes it. You say that you want to get to the truth, and I believe that you're actually running a hidden agenda. I don't think it's the truth that you seek. I think it's confusion that you want to create. And I see you pitting Calvinists against Armenians. I see you uh, trying to pit Calvinists against each other, Calvinist girl, my wife, against uh, Monty. And I think that you're just literally trying to use us to do your own dirty work. Um, you have a habit of making a lot of straw men and then dispatching them and dancing around them in victory, being very excited that you really think you've, you've defeated the Word of God or you've defeated uh, some of us folks that are Christians. And I think that really what this comes from is that you have a very uh, high view of man and you have a very low view of God and you are not really addressing the God of the Bible, but you're addressing a God of your own understanding. Um, you you seem to approach this thing from a, a standpoint that many people do and that man is basically a good person that we're good people and that um, we desperately want to please God and go to heaven and uh, this mean old nasty God won't let us go there unless we know the secret password or unless we've been uh, elected and selected and the problem is that's not true men don't want to be with God, they don't love God, they're enemies of God. And this includes you in your unregenerate heart. You hate God, you hate His rules, you hate His laws, you hate His righteousness, and you don't want to submit to that. And man is not the measure of all things. That's, that's the problem with this mode of thought, is that uh, you're not God, God is God. And I don't believe that man is the measure of all things. I believe God is the measure of all things. One of your arguments that you put forth is that God did not follow his own rules. And I want to put forth a thought, and the reason I want to put it forth in the way that I want to is because you've essentially tied your losing your faith to your children, looking in your boy's eyes and, and placing yourself in the position of God. And how could this evil, mean, wicked, wicked megalomaniacal God uh, condemn one of your children to hell because he's reprobate and the other one uh, to heaven because he's elect. And 
you've also talked about the fact that uh, that you know your children were the reason that your uh, heart just couldn't accept this God. Well, it's a really good example to use is to look at your children because one day your children are going to look at you and your one of your boys is going to look at you and say I don't want to go to bed dad uh, you get to stay awake why don't I get to stay awake and you're going to look at your child and you're going to say you need to go to bed because I told you to go to bed and they're going to continue to press the point and at some point you're going to become angry and the reason you're going to become angry is because you know that you have certain privileges that that child does not. You have a certain uh, sense of judgment and understanding that he needs more rest than you do uh, and that he needs to follow the rules that you set down. Another example might be they see you playing street hockey and they want to play in the street unattended. They want to play in the street alone. They want to do what you've done and you would never allow them to do that uh, or you'd be a derelict father if you would allow them to do that because they don't have the right nor the discernment, the knowledge, uh, the maturity to do what it is that you do. Well, the basic difference between God and us and why God can pass judgment on others and we can't is because God is righteous. He is holy and we are not. We are not righteous and therefore we do not have the same privileges of smiting our enemies such as God has. Uh, he has the right. He's the one that slung the stars and the moons and the heavens out there. He's created everything. And he can do with it as he pleases. And he is perfectly righteous and holy. You know, we don't have all the pieces to the puzzle. And when you think that you do, when you approach it from a standpoint of philosophy and try and process all this with your own human mind and say, my human mind is the measure of all things, and you use rationalism to approach all of this and don't leave any room for God's mystery, uh, then you're essentially putting God on trial according to our standards. Uh, Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is God speaking. God is not a megalomaniac. Um, man is responsible for his actions. I suggest that you spend some time reading and looking into compatibilism. Um, this will give you a better idea uh, and hopefully you'll stop making these straw men and understand that while God is sovereign man is also responsible um, and that God allows sin, God uses sin, he restrains it when he wishes, he allows it when he wishes to suit his purposes and that doesn't make him responsible for it now, human logic would say, if I allow a crime to happen on the street and I see it, I could have prevented it, I'm just as guilty of that crime. That doesn't apply to God. Why doesn't it apply to God? Well, because the Bible says that God is holy and God is, God is pure and God is not responsible for sin. And I don't know exactly how that works. Nobody does. Uh, but that's what the Bible says, and therefore we need to deal within that. And when we get to the point where we hit that mystery, that mystery stops at the attributes of God. We know what the attributes of God are and, uh, and, and that's where the mystery lies. You know, I, I hear many times the argument uh, as soon as we Calvinists bring up Romans 9, oh, you know, you run into Romans 9, you can't use that. And uh, Romans 9, of course, says that uh, God will have mercy on whom he has mercy and he will, he, he will, uh, he will uh, pass judgment on who he chooses to pass judgment on. If he doesn't want to have mercy on someone, uh, then he won't. And, you know, if God wants to raise up vessels for destruction, then he is perfectly well within his right to do so, and it is not our right to question it. Just because people don't like the fact of what Romans 9 says doesn't mean we can't just ridicule it and say, oh, well, you can't always use that. I mean, it's, it's a text. It's in the Bible. It's the Word of God. Um, whether you like it or not, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And I hope that this truth penetrates in your heart, that uh, you have been making an idol in your own mind, you've been passing judgment on God, and that you need to bow to God in this life uh, rather than in the next for eternity uh, to be in perdition. God bless you. I hope this message penetrates your heart. Swallow
was lost, but now I'm found.